Today I'm going to be talking to you about maps and how they use hash functions. So a map is any kind of set of data where there's this thing that you want to link with some other stuff. So think about a dictionary where you have words and you want to link them to the definitions or the index at the back of a book where you have a concept and you want to link it to the pages where that concept's explained. There's lots of sets of items where given one piece of it, you want all the other information related to it. This is a mapping. And so formally in data structures, a key, which is the item that you have maps to the value, which is the stuff that you want. So for a dictionary, the word is the key and the definition is the value we want. For a book index, the topic or concept is the key and the pages where the topic is discussed is the values that we want to get back. Um, you might have an employee database and in that case, the employee's ID is the key and when we give, some, give the database the key, we want to get back the employee record. So the main idea with a map is that we really want fast access to the stuff associated with that key. So in Java, we have a map abstract data type, and these are sort of the main um, methods that you need for working with a map. So we wanna put, and that says put a mapping into our collection. So we're going to say, here's the key and here's the value. Um, and if in our map, there's already something associated with that key, then we're going to overwrite the value. So if we had an employee ID that was 73 and we had an employee record that was associated with Abdul, and then we had that already in our um, database of employees, and then we put in another key that was the same and we said 73, and now we're going to put in a value that was Tom, well, that Tom employee record would overwrite the Abdul employee record because every key has to be unique. Now we also want to be able to get things out. So we um, have a get method where we give the database or the collection the key. So that might be the number 73 and it would give us back Tom or all the records associated with Tom. We can check to see if a key has a mapping, if there's a, a data set. Um, we can also check and see if a value is in our data set, but that's much less efficient. Typically we want to be checking the key and not checking the value because the key will um, have fast access if we've, if we've done our map well, and the value will require us to look at every item in the map and see if the values match. So that's not something we typically want to do very often. We also want to be able to remove objects and we're going to say, give the key, so we give the key 73 as the employee number, and that would remove the Tom record from um, our collection. And finally, we want to be able to clear, which would clear all the entries, etc. cetera. So um, this is sort of the general stuff that you want when you're doing a map or creating a mapping. Um, there's also things like size and is empty and sort of the, your standard collection stuff, but this is the stuff that's specific to a map. All right. So we use a, a map when we want really fast access. We know the key, give us the value, give us the stuff that's associated with, the, with it. So the question is, well, what underlying data structure are we gonna use to implement this idea of accessing a value based on giving a key? You could use an array, linked list, tree, heap, array list. You can think about some of these and, and they just don't really work very well because you have to um, navigate through them or traverse them. Um, a heap wouldn't work well because we don't want the biggest thing necessarily. We just want given a key, give us the stuff. Array list is kind of the closest to what we want. Um, an array list would work if we knew that our keys were say the numbers zero to nine. Then we could have an array that was 10 items long and we'd say give us three and it would give us whatever's in the uh, array list item slot three. That's great if what you have for your keys are positive numbers that range from zero to end. But that's not usually what we have. Think about the dictionary. We've got a bunch of words. Well, those aren't positive numbers ranging from zero to N. So we need to come up with some other way that allows us to get that fast access. Here's the key, give me the stuff um, that works even when the key is not necessarily these positive integers in this nice small range. So we're going to use a hash table. 
And so you've already heard a little bit about hash functions and you'll recall that a hash function takes some key, some input, and turns it into a hash index, which is a positive integer, um, and that gives us direct access into the hash table array. So if our table is a certain size, say it's 100, then we will be doing um, a hash function that's mod 100, and any number that we give it will generate an index that's between 0 and 99 based on that mod. So by turning some other thing into a hash index, that allows us to get fast access to the hash table and all of our stuff will be stored in the hash table at that index that's appropriate based on the hash function. Um, and so, you know, in this example, I've said our keys may be um, an employee ID that ranges from 400,000 to 499,999. And you could say, well, wait a second, but if, if that's our employee IDs, why don't we just subtract 400,000 and then we'd have 0 to 99,999? Well, you could do that if you really were using up most of those, um, you know, 100,000 values. But say you only had, you know, 100 employees and their numbers just happen to be in that wide range. That still doesn't, that would make us an array that's 100,000 elements long that would be very sparse and almost empty. So it's not always the case that it's really easy to just sort of do this simple arithmetic. You typically want to think hard about your spread of keys and how you can map them. So what are the decisions you have to make? Um, the two big ones are what's the hash function you're going to use and how big do you make the hash table? So a rule of thumb would be that a hash table should typically about be about 50% bigger than your data set. So if you have um, 100 employees, you make a hash table that's got 150 slots in it. Um, if you have a perfect hash function, then your table size can be n. So that's like basically having an array list and you have employee IDs and the IDs actually range from 0 to 100 and you just simply map them into an array list. In that case, you don't need to use any of this hash function stuff. You just use a straight array list. So um, then you have to come up with a hash function and you want something that will kind of distribute your keys evenly across the table uh, because you don't want a whole bunch of things ending up hashing into the same slot if you can possibly help it. And a rule of thumb here is that if you mod your key by a prime number, that can help make for an even distribution. And that means that you would maybe try to make your table um, the size of a prime number. Okay, so hash fun functions. Typically what you've seen is that the common simple method is that you do modular division of the key by the size of the hash table. And you may say, but wait a second, I thought you said that our keys could be strings. And that's true. Um, you know, we could have strings of characters. And in that case, what we're going to do is we're going to do some manipulations on the string, maybe take the middle three characters in the string, and we're going to convert them to ASCII and do a hash function on, say, the addition of those three ASCII codes or something like that. As long as you come up with a method and you apply it consistently, it will work. And there's tons of different methods that you can use for creating hash functions. Some of them are called folding, mid-square, radix transformation. There's um, a bunch of them. They're all different um, and you can look any of these up and try to use them. But we'll, for the most part, just th think about this common simple method of modular division by the size of the hash table, preferably a prime number. All right, so how do you create a hash map in Java? Well, you, the hash map um, is, uh, takes two different generics, the key and the value. Um, so you don't want to use primitives here. And typically you're going to have some kind of uh, key like a integer or a string, and then your value is going to be an object, the, the set of objects that you want to um, contain the stuff. So here's an example. We have 80 employees at a company. They have random employee IDs and they're six digit numbers that range from 600,000 to almost a million. We create a hash map that has a table that's a prime number somewhat bigger than N. So our N is 80. And so we want something bigger, maybe about uh, you know 80 plus 40. That would be one and a half times. That's 120. Well, a close prime number is 131. 
So let's create a hash map that's got 131 slots in it. And the hash map is going to take an integer, that's going to be our employee ID, and then it's going to take the whole employee object, which is all the information about each employee, and create mappings. Um, you could also specify uh, or create your hash map without specifying an initial capacity. And then Java can create one for us and it will resize it if it needs to, etc. But that tends to be less efficient. Often when we're creating a hash map, we tend to know how many items we're going to need. And so it's best if we can tell it. So the Java hash map, there's a couple things you need to know. It's going to use chaining for collisions. Um, so that means if two employee IDs, for example, mapped to the same slot in the hash map, then there'd be a linked list of employee objects coming out of that array cell. Um, and the hash map, the Java hash map has a load factor of 0.75%, so 75%. The load factor basically says when the array is that full, let's actually increase the size of the array. Um, because once the array gets beyond that load factor, you'll start to get more and more collisions as you add things to the hash map, and we want to reduce the number of collisions. So the load factor is 75%. That's a fairly common load factor for implementations of hashing, um, and that's what it is in the Java uh, hash map. Now, what you do need to understand, and this is why it's best to specify the size of your hash map um, at the beginning, if you know it, is that when the load factor is reached, the hash map has to be increased in size and basically completely redone. Every item that's in the hash map has to be rehashed because we remember we are using the size of that array as um, part of the hash and the size changes. So that means the most items positions in the new hash table will have to change. So this is an expensive thing to have to do. Um, luckily, you probably don't have to do it. It probably doesn't have to be done very often. And of course, all of this stuff in the Java hash map is taken care of for you. If you're the end user programmer and you're using Java's hash map, you don't have to worry about dealing with collisions because Java's implementation will, will deal with it. And you don't have to worry about when it reaches the load factor, um, Java will resize the hash map completely for you and you won't even see it happening.